we're here. We are live and we are ready for a mailbag show. Me and Dan Besbris are ready to go to answer your questions. And of course, Michael Bolton, the creep, is here on the side. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. You're not a creep. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and are you ready for some hot five on five action? I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble on TikTok at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to PricePicks.com slash Locked On NBA. And use the code, all lowercase, locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms, but you don't care about any of that stuff because we are here to answer your questions. And by we, I mean me, and I also mean the big fella himself, Daniel Besbris Jr. Welcome back, Dan. Yeah, big fella. I get called that when I'm in a room for a, full of children, so that felt pretty good. Yeah, look, uh, in, an, uh, in an Australian level of vernacular, there's two ways that big fella gets used. It gets used for a uh, Shaquille O'Neal-sized human or someone that's the size of Muggsy Bogues. Now, whichever yeah. one of those is you, I, I, I can't judge, Dan, because we're only seeing each other through a screen here. So I'm just going to assume you're more on the Shaq side, and that's just a really, really gigantic board behind you. But yeah, we're all... We're we're all big fellas in our own mind. So let's get through and um, get some questions because <laughs> that's what we're here for. All right, all right, all right. So, um, all right, I'm just going to go through these questions and see what we can find that is good for us to talk about here. Um, all right, well, here's a, here's a good question. Scott says, it's just a nice little dynasty one to warm us up. Would you take Ja Morant or Zach Levine for dynasty leagues? Now, historically, Dan, Levine has been a much better category league player than Morant. Morant is also significantly younger than Levine. He's also more of a star. He's also got more significant off-court concerns. So what would you do in that situation? Man, that's actually a, that's a great question. Um, it is. I'm, prob- I'm probably going Levine mostly because of the off-the-court stuff. I, I, I'm hoping that Joss solves everything, but it's just, that's a big, big roll of the dice. Um, you know me, I'm more of a nine-cat roto sort, so Levine typically has the edge there anyway. Um, so I'm going to avoid potential pitfalls here. I know I'm avoiding the the superstar level player also, um, but I have faith that Zach Levine still has at least a, like a decent chunk of years left. He's not an old guy by any stretch. No, is he tw- uh, 27, 28? So, yeah. So he's, you got your prime. You still got whatever like tail end of that. I mean, we're talking about maybe six, seven more years if you really wanted to. Mm. Um, so sure, maybe you get a few more out of job, but uh, too much risk for me. I'll go. I'll go on the safe side. Yeah, I think I tend to lean that way as well. Morant just hasn't had any sort of strong category value. He's a good points guy, he's a good assist guy, but he struggles in basically every other area. That's not true. His field goal percentage is all right. Um, but there is just so much of a risk there with Morant that even if even if he did elevate to become a better category league player than Levine, we don't have a guarantee of anything that's going to happen with him at the moment. So it is uncertain. So I, I probably lean that way in terms of uh, Levine as well. All right, Um Dan Ibarra, this is an interesting question. I think there's a lot to this one. Well, maybe there's not a lot, but it says, do we add Skylar Mays? And the context behind this, Dan, is obviously Anthony Simons is out. Old mate Scooter Henderson is out with an ankle problem. And then you'll be shocked to know this, Dan. I'm not sure if you heard. But uh, Malcolm Brogdon playing 40 minutes a night resulted in a soft t- tissue injury. I don't, know who no could have se- I don't know who could have seen it coming. It's just, honestly, it's impossible to know. That's going to sideline him three weeks or so. Now, the problem here with Mays is I do think that it's, as a just general surface question, I do think he's generally worth an ad. But they don't play until Sunday. So maybe Scoot is back then. But if Scoot is out then, then Mays is going to play 40 minutes and he's going to put up amazing numbers. But if Scoot is back, Scoot comes in, he takes the Brogdon minutes, maybe a few less because he's coming back off his own injury. Mays plays 22-23. You use him for Sunday, which is an 11-game day anyway. And I'm not even sure you would use him. So while on in theory, the idea there is great, it might turn out to be a bit of a fart in your mouth. 
Yeah, I mean, again, as as more of the games cap type, I'll throw the other side of that on, which is I'm not as worried about the the possible bad scheduling situation there. Um, what do we know about Skylar Mays? Mostly what we saw at the tail end of last year. He played something like the last two weeks as the starting point guard for the Blazers, and he put up pretty good numbers. I think good. it was like 15 and 8, something like that. Yeah. Um, so he, he was I'd so say, good they had to stop him playing because they were winning games. That's, yeah, accidentally <laughs> almost screwed themselves out of a draft yeah. pick, and they ended up with Scoot, who may take his minutes away. Uh, it's like the end of a Curb Your Enthusiasm episode, <laughs> but I, I'm still into it. I, I, I just, like, if you're getting a point guard playing 30-some-odd minutes, you almost have to do it in the NBA because there's so few ways that he could screw this up as, you know, his percentages are not terrible from what we've seen. Again, we don't have a huge body of work, but... Uh, I'm into it. I think it's uh, I think he's a good pickup. Um, and if you only get a game or two out of him, I'm okay with that because they could be two really good games. That is, you said something really interesting there, and I was going to have a have a have a go at you, but I'm not going to do that because I'm going to find a question that ties into something that you said there. I've just got to find it. Come on, guys, ask the question that I want asked. Here it is. Brooks says, "Is it the keynote speaker time? Is it Keontae George time?" Because Dan, you just said. If you're a starting point guard in the NBA playing 30 mm. minutes, I'm going to have interest in it. I've been I've been plowing that line through everyone all season. That is why I am in on, hey, let's just see what Kobe White can do. I know you're very anti-Kobe White, but I'm like, a starting point guard who plays 30 minutes a night it has to be interesting, right? It has. There's something there. And that is exactly why I've been stashing Keontae George for the last couple of weeks because I knew, like you do, that Talon Horton Tucker is not good. And he was, he was never going to last. And watching him run an offense was like, I don't know, it was like I had diarrhea coming out of my eyes. It was dreadful, right? He's gone. He's done. So yes, is it Keontae George time? Yes. Is Keontae George going to be great? Probably not. Like he might struggle. He might sit in the Kobe White zone. He might average 12 points and six and a half assists, maybe a steal, and he might shoot 41% from the field. But there is a finite supply of 30-minute-a-night starting point guards in the NBA, and if they're available... I want to get him. Yeah, I, and and I'll I'll sort of half defend myself on the Kobe White thing, um, mostly because he is technically the point guard, but also that team sort of runs the offense through like three other guys and not that him is, in a way where with Utah they need a guy to that get is, the ball to dudes who mm-hmm. can't orchestrate. So I'm actually very much with you on seeing what Keontae George can be, even if he is just a distributor, which kind of is like. That's what that team missed. They lost Mike Conley and everything just completely fell apart for the Jazz because nobody could get the guys the ball in the right place. And yes, I mean, again, we've both been talking about how Taylor Orton Tucker is is terrible. So this is a move that was long overdue, which is funny because we're only two and change weeks into the season. Uh, I'm much more into Keontae George than I am into Kobe White, who I classify as point guard in starting slot only. Uh, But these other ones are, yeah, I like it because you could get those extra assists. Um, And again, I asked the question of like, how do you screw it up? And Kobe White is sort of the answer to that, which is like shoot 39% and don't get that many assists. So give me the other guys, because I think they are super interesting. I'm just trying to look it up now, but off the top of my head, I feel like Kobe White's had six and seven assists the last two games. Maybe I'm wrong. Someone can fact check me. Oh, well, I fact, think he has had two good ones. I'll yeah. fact check myself in real time. Oh, there you go. Six assists and seven assists and five the game before that. Those, Dan, are actually good numbers. And yeah, I don't, I don't know better. that it continues because the games before were 4 8 one, three, four, two. But things seem to have sort of shifted the last couple of games. We'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Uh, and that takes us to uh, Kevin. I love you for this because that transitions us into talking about the Bulls. How real do you think Caruso's recent run is now? And I, I feel like you're going to share the same opinion as me here. He is probably their third best player. I don't think without any question at all, right? It's nonsense that Torrey Craig and Patrick Williams get run over him. He is one of the best defenders in the entire NBA, and he should play 30 single, thirty minutes every single game. And if he did, he should be on every single roster, but they seem to hold him back all the time. Last game was really encouraging. It was an overtime game, but he showed what he can do. I think he's almost a little bit like the Malcolm Brogdon situation, that if they are going to give the minutes, you get him, you ride with it, it's going to fall apart. He's going to hurt his elbow, his ankle, his knee. Mm-hmm. Something's going to fall apart. But... It's so very obvious. And this is part of the back to the Keontae George thing. Like when we watch, we go, the coaches at some point are going to realize that Horton Tucker is not it. And at some point, Billy Donovan has to go, oh, we just have to play Caruso 30 minutes every single night and it will fall apart, but we've got to do it. So I've got no problem with grabbing him. And then we see where it goes. I am a thousand percent with you on that one. I'm a, a, a Caruso nut as a, a Laker fan. I also have him on our my 30 deep team 
Um, but it is that same thing. Anytime he plays bigger minutes, he does get hurt. He just he can't make mm-hmm. it through a season healthy. It's sort of I think I referred to this in the past as uh, Patrick Beverly itis, where guys just go so hard for so long mm-hmm. that their body falls apart. Um, I wish Caruso could play 30 minutes. And if there was like an inkling that they were going to cut him loose, then I'd be all over it. But it does scare me because you get those in between ones where he's playing 19 or 20. And that's because he's not, you know, he's not scoring all that much when he's out there. He's mostly collecting a little bit of a lot of things, very good defensive stats. So I'm always worried about that other shoe kind of dropping but you're right it does feel like i mean he's consistently their best plus minus guy which i know is a stat that doesn't always tell us the truth but with some guys it does and he's one of those get him out there maybe get a few wins are they worried that he his body falls apart and then they don't win a game for a month maybe but they look pretty bad without him so yeah i mean you know head to head side he's sort of doing enough day to day roto games cap side you end up getting a little cute with it and you miss out on the good one and you play him on the bad one. Uh, but I love Alex Caruso and I have no problem with folks picking him up and then kind of giving two fingers crossed and hope that it lands sooner than later. The, the plus minus point is interesting because you're right on a game by game basis doesn't mean anything, but when it's consistently over weeks, months, seasons, that means something. It's why I've always been like DeMar DeRozan puts up interesting numbers, but I'm not sure he helps you win because every season of his career bar, I think two, the team's been better when he's been on the bench. And at some point, like, that means something, right? At some point, that has to mean something when it happens over 11 years out of 13 that you can put up individual numbers, but with the challenges of building around you that leads to a lot of other problems. And again, single game plus minus, wow, this guy's minus 30, you know, 10-point win might say something, but it doesn't tell the whole story. But when it adds up over 300 games, then we get into a little bit more of like, oh, maybe there's something to this, but we've got more stuff to get to because today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. And the Jace case, we've talked about Jace case plenty of times on here, and that is making sure you guys are prepared in case there are situations where you need emergency medication and through issues with supply chain or whether it's disasters um, that cut off your supply to healthcare and medication access, having the Jace case at home for your family is imperative. Not only do they have the five essential and life-saving antibiotics, but you can get your daily medications there as well. Get a year's supply and stop that problem. You don't want to be in a situation where you're taking your daily medication and you're running out and you go into the pharmacy, you go into the drugstore and they say, sorry guys, it's uh, out of stock. And you go, what am I going to do? I've got five tablets left. So you have to end up cutting them in and half suboptimal healthcare results out of that. Plus, they've also now got generic erectile dysfunction medications for Viagra and Cialis and another one that I've never heard of. So go into all of that. You can get a discount as well using the code locked on 20 bucks off of your Jace case and all those other daily medications that you can get chucked in there as well. So go to jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E medical.com. Use the code locked on and get $20 off your purchase. All right, that will bring us back in to talk to the big fowler again, Daniel Bezbris. And there was another question that I just want to quickly touch on. VG Apollo says, how many votes should it be to vote, veto a trade in a 12-team league? Zero, because you should never vote on a trade. Absolutely never. Not once. Do not have votes in a trade. Let me restate this, please. If you have league votes in a trade, do not do it. Dan, your thoughts? Yeah, it's crap. It's trash. <laughs> there we go. Um, it's, it's garbage. And, and I'll, can I say one reason why that people don't usually bring up? People can veto a trade for either side or no reason at all. It's nonsense. Like you could think t- four people in a league could think team A is winning the trade and six people in a league could think team B is winning the trade and they all veto it. And that actually means it's a fair damn trade if the league disagrees on who wins. It's it's get a league with a commissioner you trust. That's such trash. You heard it here first. Dan does not believe in democracy. Let's go through to the next question from Parsi. <laughs> it says, is Bruce Brown a just a steals streamer? No, is my opinion. He is a good steals guy. I was somewhat skeptical of Brown in terms of heading over this season. Like I knew he'd get more minutes. That was my, my uh, aim or, or expectation, and he has done that. But the idea that his assist numbers would translate over just had no hope of happening because he played as a backup point guard last season, and he st- plays as a starting small forward this season, and he gets zero minutes playing as point guard. So we knew that was going to happen. But is he just a steel streamer? No, the rotations in Indiana down are frustrating at the moment. And yeah. I, think that, I think they'll settle out, but I would to me, there's no purpose in dropping a Bruce Brown at this stage. No, you got a starting caliber small forward who's playing 31 minutes a game. Um, I'm a, there are a few things that he's doing that I, uh, 
going to say I'm hoping they improve on. I guess I can't guarantee it. Uh, he is one of my, I think I referred to him earlier today as my two kind of toughest holds right now. But like, you're not going to find somebody playing those minutes with his uh, portfolio, pedigree, whatever you want to call it, has like has done it in the past. Uh, I'm very much on board with holding him. I am, however, I know you. the way you phrased it there was hope that, that rotations would settle in Indiana. I have no hope that the rotations <laughs> will settle in Indiana. Uh, I wish they would because Jalen Smith is playing his butt off this year and Aaron Neesmith is putting up pretty good numbers, but you just have no idea when they're going to get 26 minutes or nine, and that's a really hard set of dice to roll. Um, I think part of the problem is that they're either getting smacked by 50 or, or dropping 50 bombs on other teams as well, and that sort of um, skewed stuff a little bit. There was something I was going to ask, and I just completely forgot what it was, but it was an interesting question. So if I can find it, it would be great. But it doesn't matter if I can't. We'll get to something different. Okay, there we go. <laughs> you um, see me all the time. Yeah, what a, what, a, what a great segment that was. Um, all right, so where are we? Why does Miles Turner never play more than 25 minutes? Well, the answer to that question is he does. So I don't know how, where we go from that. Um, do I drop Mitchell Robinson for Bismack Biombo? Jason, this is a very specific question, but the answer to this question is not very specific. And I'll tell you just, no, you don't do that. But no. secondly, like just be be really cautious about the way that you approach it. I have seen some crazy ad drop suggestions come across my virtual desk over the course of this season. Be someone who's like stepped in for a starter for three games. Like, do I drop... Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. Bruce Brown, not not even Bruce Brown. Let's use someone who else is Julius Randle. Man, this guy's killing me. He's killing my percentages. Uh, do I drop him to stream in Jordan Hawkins? Like, no. What are you doing? Like, have a longer view versus what happens for the next two days. And while Hawkins might start for the next three weeks or so, also always remember that when someone pops off and has a big game, Dan, and I'm sure you're going to agree with this. When you go and add them after that, you don't get that big game they just had. Right, you get more of the median outcomes. You get the ups and downs that come with it, and that might fall away very, very quickly. Versus dropping someone who's going to have significantly more value in January or February, just so you can chase what happened two days ago in the in the early stages of, of November. Now, Biombo is playing all right here, but I don't know what's going to happen when Tillman returns. I don't know what gonna, what's going to happen when Aldama ramps up. I I have zero zero doubt that Mitchell Robinson is going to remain a starting center all season, and I would say he's even performing better on a per minute basis as it, or per game basis as it is now. So, just don't be chasing that production that has a real or has a limited shelf life for a guy that you might have seen struggle for one game. Yeah, and I think there's 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 this human nature part of it where you see the big game and you don't really know what the midpoint is going to be. You start to talk yourself into a midpoint that's higher than reality. But what you said is a really good way to think about it. And from a math standpoint, you've now missed what's probably going to be one of the biggest games that mm. this person, whoever it is, player X, is going to have over a stretch. So you're actually getting production that is below their average the rest of the way because you've missed a good one. Um, back on the Mitchell Robinson one. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, he's putting up actually pretty good numbers this year. And the one thing that you could point at and say, dude's shooting only 49%. So one of his key elite categories of field goal percent isn't even happening yet. Uh, Julius Randall's another example. I can't stand having him on my fantasy team, but you're not going to drop him for a streamer because this is a guy that historically has been between 50 and a hundred and nine cat for checks watch. I don't know how many years now, uh, you got to have a bit of a long view. I, I know we all want to be making moves all the time, but there are actually a good reason to have like five or six different leagues is that maybe in some you can make a move and in others you can take the long view and you still kind of get to scratch that itch of making a fantasy pickup. Uh, but yes, I'll, oftentimes the right move is no move at all. Uh, I say the same thing for trades, but I've got more to talk about on that waiver wire thing in a second, Dan. We'll get to it in a sec. But today's episode is also brought to you by Price Picks. Yes, Price Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It's also the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against numbers. You don't have to go against thousands of people. You don't have to go against individual spreadsheets. You don't have to be out there with players who have got all the time in the world to put up a winning lineup. It's just you with player projections, and you look at the numbers that go more or less. That's all you need to do. And between two to six of those individual player projections, and you can win up to 25 times your money back. And with basketball season starting, they've actually got these new combo projections as well. So you can go into the combos page on the specials league on the site, and you can actually choose like a combination football, basketball, player projection. So the example they give here is LeBron James and Travis Kelsey, and the number they said is 10.5, and that's combined three-pointers made and receptions. And you just choose, was it going to be more or is it going to be less? 
do that, and you're set. They've also got the reboot policy. So if your player gets injured in the first half, doesn't return in the second half, well, that selection gets rebooted. And PricePix is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So go to pricepix.com slash LockedOnNBA and use the code LockedOnNBA and you get a first deposit match up to $100. That is pricepix.com slash LockedOnNBA. The code is LockedOnNBA and that first deposit match gets you up to $100. PricePix is daily fantasy sports made easy. So the question, uh, I'm, I'm on a constant, constant, maybe not. I'm on a constant sort of thought process or goal, strive, journey to make fantasy basketball bigger, but more importantly, better, right, Dan? And I, it, it bothers me immensely that all of our default settings are 10-man rosters, three bench players, which I believe started when fantasy basketball started, when there was like 24 teams in the league or whatever it was. Well, we have 550 plus players rostered in the league now, and we have starting spots for way less than a quarter of them. We have no bench spots available. We can't stash players. So what ends up happening is that all of our time is made up making these decisions. Well, this guy is underperforming by 10% at the moment, so I've got to drop him and get the next guy in. And we invariably just chase and miss the production or we have less patience on these guys. Whereas other fantasy sports, baseball, way more extended rosters. Fantasy football, your bench is the same size as your starters. In basketball, we're always thinking, well, who's the guy off the waiver I'm going to get to bring in? Where in reality, I just, I don't know why that is. The, the default is because it was set 50 years ago, whenever it was, and we've just never updated it with the increased roster size, the increased talent level in the NBA, the increased amount of teams in the NBA, and this constant need to churn through the, you know, the 140th guy versus the 160th guy, when in reality... Like all of these guys should be somewhere on a fantasy roster, but we have to make these decisions where the, the difference between them is so small. And when you go back and forward and the in-game variance makes it just impossible to make those decisions correctly. I think we should be more rewarded for more foresight, more planning, more looking at these guys. Like even having 10 starters, do we actually, why, is it, why do we have such low numbers? I, again, I know why, but I just think that these things lead to um, a lot of these situations where we're considering dropping Mitchell Robinson when we shouldn't be. Like that shouldn't be a decision that anyone even has to bring up in their mind. Yeah, so, you know, I... I- I can speak more, I think, to the uh, the Roto side of this because that's what I, I play more of. Um, one thing that I like to do in the leagues I'm commissioning is just extend the bench, um, five bench slots, and raise the games cap. So instead of starting 10, you're basically your 10 best guys, you're starting more like your best 12 or 13. Yep. I don't need an injured list because it's games capped, so that you know the extra bench slots, I guess, kind of function as that. But it does put more players on rosters there's still stuff that comes up on the waiver wire. So you're not taking that fun out of the game. So I know a lot of people love actually the feeling of picking up and dropping. And that's part of the enjoyment is just to see churn on your roster. But it does, I think, I don't know if that it necessarily makes it more complicated anyway. I think it's actually just more fair. You get how you, you can stash players a little more easily. You use your bench to some degree, which I don't know. The Yahoo public leagues, you almost never have to use your bench at all because it's a games cap of 82. There's three IL slots, so you can do whatever the hell you want with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I my goal, your goal is to expand fantasy minus to try to simplify it. And I think maybe between the two of those, it's, it's stuff that we could improve upon. And frankly, I'm bringing this full circle a little bit. I love your idea of a 40 games cap weekly league. I, I wish that I wasn't at my kid's little league practice and I could have been in the draft on that thing because... That to me is a way to expand head to head where, you know, the teams, intermediate leagues, whatever, if you're in a beginner league and one person is streaming, they're going to destroy everybody in a head to head league. And it just shouldn't be that way. So I don't know, long roundabout way of saying, yes, there are things we can do to improve upon this. We should do them. Yeah, I look, I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm very much in that we need expanded rosters. And like, I think that everyone who's in the locked on fantasy basketball, ball, you might have issues with, oh, I can't use fan tracks or whatever it is, or the games cap is hard to work out. It, it's, You'll figure it out. Like it, it is to me. It's the first time I'm using the weekly games cap in head to head. I've been fine with it, but yeah, you know, everyone's going to have different learning curves on this stuff. But the point is that with those with those leagues, there's still plenty of activity on the waiver wire. Even though in those leagues we have 18 player rosters in a 12 team league, so we go like 200 deep in a draft, and there is still waiver action every single day, and players yeah. coming up who become useful. Bismack Biombo, a name we referenced um, right here in that question above. Um, is a guy that you know, gets added and things that do happen through the season. It's just not that we're you know, cycling through. Like this question here, is Jaden McDaniels droppable in 12-team nine-cat leagues? Now, J- 
Jay McDaniels is not a particularly strong fantasy player. He's not a good rebounder. He's an elite perimeter defender who doesn't get elite perimeter defensive stocks. Or stocks stats is what I meant Uh-oh, to say. Jesus. I know. I know. Back wow. Huge, huge mistake there. He's not a high usage player. Um, he gets into foul trouble, but he's still a really useful player. But because of where he sits and the, the fluctuations in his performance, we have to have these decisions. But look, bringing this back, I think that you would want to hold McDaniels, but I'm also way lower on his overall ceiling than others are. Dan, where do you sit on Jaden in uh, category leagues? Yeah, he sits kind of right on that streamer bubble. I think he finished, I don't have it in front of me, like around 105, 110 last year, which in head-to-head, if you're staying healthy, that's a guy you can probably roster for most of the season. He's sort of right on that edge. Um, but like, you, yeah, I mean, he doesn't get that many rebounds. He doesn't get that many assists. He could be a one three one steal one block guy, but you need a little bit. You need something beyond that. And in his current construct, the team around him, he's just not going to get to do much else. Sure. I feel like he suffers from you know, Shane Battier syndrome of just being an outstanding real life player who's going to be on the court a whole bunch, uh, but it doesn't. You just don't see it on the fantasy side, uh, and that's okay. Uh, but I'm probably leaning ever so slightly to saying. You can you can leave him on the waiver in twelve teamers. I don't think it's going to matter that much because he's right on that that bubble where, like you said, everybody's basically about the same. I think what you said there is key. Like I probably wouldn't drop him, but what you said it's probably not going to matter is is the real is the real thing about that. It's not going to make that much difference because if you do drop him and add three different players in during the week, where well, you've made up that production anyway. So it's it is, and that's gets to that thing that, that I'm talking about is that there's a group of seventy guys who could all be worthwhile of your last roster spot, and if you just move them in and out and in and out, um, you gain more value than holding onto a player where you should have that ability to feel more invested in someone like a Jaden McDaniels. LB yeah, says, good. yeah, he is good. Look, he's amazing. He is, if not, look, the best. He's one of the top three perimeter defenders in the NBA, like him, OG. Um, I don't even know who else is in that mix, but it's, it's got to be close to those two guys. It's probably someone else I'm completely forgetting. LB says, will John Collins do more this rest of season? I don't know. LB, this is basically exactly what I thought he would do. So he is almost exactly where I was on projections with him. He is doing that, and I don't really see why it will change. Yeah, I think the only thing you might get out of Collins is, and you hope maybe the free throw number comes up a little from low 70s to high 70s. Maybe you'd tick out near 80, and that would move him up the board a little bit. Um, But 15 and 9-ish, which is where he's at, is pretty good, I think. Maybe maybe you get a defensive stat mixed in. I know uh, he's going to be playing some center here with Walker Kessler out, so that's an opportunity for a little more. Um, I haven't been hugely disappointed. I haven't been blown away. There's a tiny bit of room for improvement, and that's, I think, all you can really ask for with somebody you drafted near whatever it was, 110. So, uh, yeah, I'm good with it. Yeah, look, he's just he's just doing what I expected, which is totally okay. Like, I don't expect him to ever get back to being the guy that he was three years ago or two years ago. I think he's just sort of what he is now, and I don't really see uh, much about that. I've got two more questions here that I do really think are interesting. One is about a trending rookie, and Kevin says, do you think that Marcus Sasser is a sell-high candidate, or do you think his production is sustainable? Dan, I'll let you hit that one first, because I've got some thoughts on this. Yeah, so, I mean, it, the concept of the sell-high is such a complicated one, because I, I don't know that you're going to get anything for him he's he's jumped into a big role with Alec Burks and Jaden Ivey out and he's hot as lava out there he's shooting 55 percent hitting three plus three pointers a game over the last week so yes the concept of the sell high is accurate in that probably doesn't shoot 55 percent and hit over three three pointers all season long but also what are you trying to get for Sasser what are you selling high for you're going to get some other hot waiver wire guy so my stance on that is Play him while he's hot. See what happens as guys come back. Does he lose his role? Does he keep it? What does that role become if the if the hot shooting tapers off? Um, but I don't think you're going to get much back for him. Do you? No, no one's trading for him. Like that, let's forget that part. Like the sell high, is not happening. No one's buying anything from it. There are a couple of things I think to hit here. Is the production sustainable? Like a hundred percent, no. There's no chance it sustains because he's shooting fifty percent from three and fifty eight percent from the field overall. Not going to happen. Guarantee it. Write it in blood. Like it's not going to happen. Right? He's not going to do that. He's also averaging like three assists and three rebounds per thirty six minutes. Putrid numbers. Like very low numbers. So at the moment, all of his value is built off. Um, high shooting numbers and the fact that he's getting a ton of minutes because Ivy, Burks, Morris, Livers, Bogdanovich, Harris, their six best shooters are all out. Now, on the flip side of that, Athletic Beat reporter James Edwards III thinks, hey, 
I reckon Sasser might be a shot to start here because the Killian Hayes, well, he's been better. The shooting spacing doesn't particularly work. Alec Burke's amazing. I don't think they've won a game since Alec Burke's got hurt, by the way. He's on off conti- yeah. continues to be absolutely amazing. But if they can get Sasser to work into a Burke's role, then that's fine. And maybe Monte Morris doesn't play. Maybe they traded him. They didn't pay anything. Maybe he just doesn't play and they like what Sass is bringing. So I've got no problem with rolling with him, but also just everything that's coming from him at the moment is because six rotation players are out and he's shooting 50% from three. The other peripherals aren't particularly strong, even though he looks good on the court. He does. That it doesn't necessarily sit at that number. So I, I agree in totality with your statement, like roll with it, add him. Maybe he sticks in a starting role, but even if he does, what he's currently doing, won't sustain at this level is yeah. I think pretty confident. And that brings me to the- Are you getting ye- are you getting yelled at about that one a lot? Because I get yelled at about Marcus Sasser, my my I don't think this lasts take on him more than I thought I would. No, I don't it was weird. I don't think I I don't think I have there's people who who are like I'm gonna drop someone good to 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 get him and keep him. I go, yeah, look just be aware that there are a lot of guys out and he might be ahead of some of them but not yeah. others. But I'm not really getting too much grief on that one, but this brings me to my last question, Dan, that I'm going to get you for, and it's from okay. Shan, Shan Ming, who it, it ties into that sell high thing. How do you convince people to trade this early in season? And here is a great... I'll ask you this question. The answer to me, for me, is zero. How many trades have gone down in any of your leagues, Dan? Uh, one. Okay. And like nine leagues. Yep. So I'm in eight, and I think it's, it's, it's been zero. And I said this the other day, and there were a few people who did push back on it. And I said, look, the more that you play fantasy basketball, the more that the people you play against and you're in a league long term, and those guys are all together or they're played longer term, the amount of trades in a league goes down significantly. I'll go through seasons when I don't execute a single trade or my league doesn't do a single trade. That just happens. And I said that a lot of the times the trades you reject are actually the better trades that you do because some people just have that itchy trade finger and there were people, oh, you've got to make moves. You have to do like, I don't, like, didn't need to convince them not necessarily right it, it's how do you convince them you can't like you you just can't you've got to put forward uh solid arguments not be trying to rip people off try and you know, yeah. play on emotions like if there's someone you see who's making crazy ad drop moves every day sure go and target them because they're going to be willing to change their roster up all the time like there was one guy in, in the locked on fantasy basketball ball shout out to you i'm not going to say your name because i don't remember it but he after the draft he made like nine trades before the season even started yeah. i was like bro like what is going on he changed 75 percent of his roster but not everyone's going to be like that. And again, I, my experience from doing this for years and years and years is that the more you do it, the less that you trade. And the desire to trade is often based not even on improving your team. It's on a desire to trade versus I'm going to make my team better in every situation. And again, people push back on me for that. But my default is going to be, hey, do you want to do this trade? No. And then I'll look into it. Like That's that's how I'm just going to approach every single deal like that because I just, yeah, I don't know. That's just that's just my experience with playing fantasy basketball. Just, I just don't think that trades happen as much when you play the game for longer. Yeah. I So I'm, I think I'm lucky that there are a few leagues I'm in that have like the one or two guys that are always trading things, which does kind of, it does keep it fresh. It is more fun to have that stuff happening. Um, personally, my trade strategy is to assess my team about two months into the season. So I basically don't do anything unless something really amazing falls into my lap, like somebody's trying to sell me on a, a superstar off to a really slow start. I'll probably take that move. But in general, I want to see what my team is strong and weak at by around December and then see if I want to lean into strengths or into weaknesses and make those fixes there. Because at that point, the ROI means I can probably offer what is a very fair trade, no skepticism needed, where I get a player back who just fits better for what my team is trying to do. That, I think, is the kind of trade that you can still pull off in fantasy leagues where it's about fit and not about trying to fleece somebody because everyone's going to be skeptical of each other going into a trade. If you try to mess with somebody, that's only going to make them even more skeptical. Go in, make a fair trade that helps your team's fit Make your team better without trying to win the trade. And that's how you can get a couple of those done. And usually by December, January, I make two or three trades every year, almost like clockwork. And they're fair, but they do help my team. And I think that's a nice way that you can can still have that, still satisfy that urge to make some trades, um, but do it in a way that doesn't piss everybody off. And some sage advice to finish the show. If you guys are tuning in now and you're asking questions that I've seen, you guys ask questions that have been answered already. We have talked about Keontae George already. We have talked about Marcus Sasser. 
Um, we have talked about, who else did we talk about? Bismack Biombo, uh, Mitchell Robinson. We talked about some other hot names uh, as well. But we've talked about a bunch of the questions that you guys are asking already. And you can go and check those out from earlier in the show. So, Dan, thank you for... Oh, Keontae George. I oh, said that already. Yeah, we, we talked about Keontae already. Um, yeah, thank you for coming on yeah, and we- answering these questions with me. Go tell people what uh, you've got cooking over there in the old uh, Besbrus lab. Well, first of all, you're very welcome. And thank you for having me. I kind of lost track of time and realized that we are actually kind of at the end of this thing here. Um, things are good. Sports Ethos has some tools now, which is cool. We haven't had those before. Uh, in my lab, I'm trying to do more um, very low-tech YouTube stuff. I have a long, long way to go, but this board has carried me quite far, and we'll see how far it can take me. Um, so that's it. Just trying to do more stuff on on YouTube, more shows, because that's the stuff that I've always loved, and I, I just want to sink more time into it, kind of coming up with ideas and whatnot. But uh, yeah, folks, find me on social. That's kind of a good hub, at Dan Bespris, and, and I'll point everybody in different directions from there. Dan, thank you for coming on. And uh, yeah, you can leave now because I'm going to hit end, end this live stream. Thanks for being a part of the show. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. And I will leave now. Bye-bye, Dan. And bye-bye to everyone here who is watching this live or listening back after the fact. So follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app and on YouTube. I think you know what to do. You thumb it up and you leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.